no contact mistakes, talking about us. Fire and swords are slow engines of destruction compared to the tongue of a gossip. So said Richard Steele, accurate words indeed. Gossip, talking about us, is a sure-fire way to destroy the imposition of your no-contact regime. When you have implemented no contact, you will have most likely ensured that you stay out of our way. You may not have been able to move house, but if you see us standing outside of your house, you call the police, or if we approach your front door, you do not open it. You block our numbers on your phone, and you do not answer any telephone number that you do not recognize. You may use your voicemail to screen calls, and if you hear our voice on the recording, you ought to immediately delete it. Even better, you should have changed your number, so we cannot ring you at all. You shut down your social media to keep us at bay, and you may even leave social media altogether. You change routes, so you do not pass where we work or frequent. You make the appropriate changes to ensure that we do not approach you in person or through technology. You may not choose to move house or job, but you put in place all other steps that you can to effect no contact. If therefore we cannot engage with you, is that not an effective no contact? It is not total no contact. One of the breaches of no contact, and it is a mistake of no contact, is continuing to talk about us to other people. It is an understandable mistake. You have just experienced the hellish roller coaster of being entangled with us. Whether you know exactly what we are or not, you realize that you had to get out and stay out, and thus you have. Nevertheless, so much of what has happened to you still does not make sense. So often, you still miss us, even though it does not make sense. You miss the brilliant warmth of the golden period, and you've been left with the frozen wasteland that it leaves behind, which is hard to endure. There is a gap, and you need to fill it in some way. The behaviour that you have been subjected to, the possibility that you are hearing about who the narcissist is now with, what the narcissist is saying about you, revisiting old manipulations, trying to fathom out what the narcissist meant, what the narcissist was doing, why things went wrong. You sit with your council of war, with friends and family, going over it again and again and again, analysing, returning to, discussing it. I still can't understand why he did this, possibly plotting some form of revenge, reacting with complete horror and utter amazement at the latest tidbit of information that is provided by one of your friends who has picked up some gossip about what the narcissist is doing now, or what, the gossip, or what the narcissist is saying about you. It is inevitable that you discuss all of these matters and more with other people, chiefly your friends, your family, but also colleagues. Possibly the police, a therapist. Indeed, such is the level of your distress that you find yourself talking to people that you ordinarily would not do so, just to get their take on it. It dominates your discussions, and often you fail to see the eye-rolling of friends and families as they are subjected to another tale about the narcissist. Inside, they groan. Not him again, they think. But their emotional empathy causes them to support you and to patiently listen as you go through for the 332nd time the events of what has happened. These individuals have listened to you during the tortuous ensnarement. They were the ones who comforted you as you wept, as you seethed with frustration and as you bellowed with rage. They helped you follow us to gather intelligence on other people that we were interacting with 
and they assisted you in the role of detective as you sought to work out what was really going on. Barely a day went by without you espousing how wonderful we once were. Barely a day went by without you bemoaning how bewildering we were. Those around you listened. They were involved, and they were living your torment too. Accordingly, it is little wonder that your friend, who does care about you, asks when they telephone you, have you heard anything from him? It is not a surprise when your mother rings to make sure you're okay by asking, are you getting any trouble from him? what's his name? It is expected that your colleague brings you a coffee and his first words are, any word from you know who? However well-meaning these people are, their continued mention of us to you is a form of ever presence. They are feeding your addiction to us. And where you sit and recount all of the examples of our behavior, you are similarly talking about us and feeding the addiction. No good comes of it. This information may well be conveyed to the narcissist and thus provides us with fuel. You will invariably become upset, annoyed, frustrated, angry, irritated as you talk about these matters and thus you suffer an adverse consequence. And because you are talking about us and alongside that thinking about us, you will increase your emotional thinking. Therefore, continuing to talk about us is a breach of your no-contact regime and must not be done. Of course, in the grip of your emotional thinking, you are misled into believing that you should talk about this, that it helps you gain clarification. But wait a minute. How many times have you gone over this and it still does not make sense to you? Should that not ought to suggest to you that logically you are not yet in a position to understand it and you should stop trying? What purpose is it serving? It is akin to continually talking about the fact that your house is on fire and doing nothing about it. You sit with your friends. My house is on fire. Yes. Have I told you the house is on fire? Yes, you've just told me that. The house is on fire. Yes, this is the third time you've now told me. I don't understand why the house is on fire. Well, it is. And do you need to understand it? Shouldn't you actually be doing something about it? And as a ridiculous example as that may sound, <clears throat> what is occurring there is that you are engaging in talking about us and accordingly causing your emotional thinking to rise, getting yourself in a position of suffering an adverse consequence with no constructive outcome from it whatsoever. You might think that you feel better for the discussion, but do you actually? Are you gaining any real clarity? And remember, no matter how well-meaning these individuals are, are they actually in a position to furnish you with accurate answers? Of course they will give you sweet tea and sympathy, and in the initial aftermath you do need a shoulder to cry on, but it should only be for a short period of time. Many of these individuals have never experienced narcissism, and even if they had, they will not understand it properly to provide you with any meaningful and constructive advice. And therefore, by continuing to talk about us, all you are doing is remaining engaged with the narcissist and continuing the misery and making it harder for you to move forward. However well-meaning these people are, their continued mention of us is this form of ever-presence as I've mentioned. They are continuing your addiction to us. As they recount with you the things that have happened, as you revisit for the twentieth time that strange night a month ago, as you recollect what went on between you and the narcissist with shakes of the head and open mouth disbelief, they are spreading and reinforcing our ever presence. Your addiction is being fed. It is as if we are with you in the same room. Your emotions remain poisoned by the mention of our name and the memory of our behaviours. In the same way as looking at an item which we gifted you maintains the ever-presence, the continued discussion of us amounts to the same thing. We remain in your mind and heightening your emotions. Accordingly, this continues your susceptibility to also being hoovered. 
you keep being reminded of us, so you may want to have some more information on us. The salami slicing occurs, taking you through the arenas of interaction. It may lead you to look at our social media, or indeed even messages, when that half bottle of Pinot Grigio starts to impact on your reasoning alongside the emotional thinking. Your no contact regime is being punctured by these repeated discussions about us. And even if you resist crumbling and reaching out to us, the fact of you still thinking about us and talking about us means that the emotional thinking remains higher so that if a hoover does break through, you are more likely to respond to it. Talking about us is not just a solitary risk, however. It is not just the risk that you are reinforcing this ever-presence, getting yourself in a position of suffering and adverse consequence and heightening your emotional thinking, but you are also risking the provision of fuel and coming up on the radar of the narcissist when that is the last thing that you should be doing. There is every chance that we will have somebody in your camp who is providing us with information. Sometimes they have been specifically placed there. Other times they are providing information through a misguided sense of fairness. If you happen to meet one of our friends, you can be guaranteed that he or she will talk about us to you. They'll mention how we are, what we've been doing, who we are with, and they'll take note of your reaction. They'll also be asking questions about you. They will not be doing this as a, as a specific messenger, but rather, because they are in our camp, they will naturally talk about us, and they will ask about you. It may seem pleasant and polite as they ask where you are living these days, or how work is going, where have you been, do you go to Rico's restaurant any longer, and if not, where do you go instead? What passes for pleasant conversation with someone who you wish to remain on good terms with, even if they are perceived as being in our camp, actually amounts to an information gathering exercise, although that individual is not operating with the specific purpose of doing that. They're a member of the coterie, and therefore they are just engaging in a conversation in an innocent manner. They have not been specifically dispatched to acquire that information from you. That can happen, but it is unusual. And if you want to understand more about the occasions where that happens, please go to the Knowledge Vault and obtain the truth about flying monkeys. This individual will invariably report back to us in the course of ordinary conversation. They will say, Oh, I saw Sandra the other day, and she is now working at such and such a place. For the most part, they do this innocently enough, wanting to tell us that they have seen you and to update us on what you're doing as part and parcel of the normal discussion about someone and that counts as social lubrication. Where we utilize a lieutenant, they have been specifically deployed as a spy. That is more unusual, and the majority of narcissists, contrary to popular belief, do not behave in that manner. Where a lieutenant is dispatched, he or she is tasked with feeding back information about you on a regular basis. What are you saying about us? How you're feeling about us? Are you hurting still? Do you pine for us? Do you curse us or want us back? Your emotions, as our name comes up, are noted and then fed back to us, and this provides us with some fuel, because we are being told how you are reacting to us. Furthermore, the fact that you are providing fuel and information which can be used, for instance, where you now work or live, who you socialize with and where, even obtaining your new contact details, puts you at an increased risk of being hoovered, and therefore there being a further puncturing of your no-contact regime. You talking about us to a lieutenant, or more commonly a member of our coterie, means this information will reach us. Thus, we gain fuel, but most of all, you have then entered a sphere of influence, and this causes a hoover trigger. And, if the hoover execution criteria are met, we will hoover you. The fact that we know that you've been talking about us is fuel, and therefore, ways more likely that we will hoover you, because, like a shark scenting blood, we anticipate, instinctively, that there is more fuel to be had. We recognize your vulnerability. We also, as a consequence of this information provided by a member of the Coterie, have now gained knowledge of a way to contact you, and therefore, that will mean it's even easier to hoover you, 
meaning that the Hoover execution criteria is more likely to be achieved, meaning a Hoover will follow. Your interaction with somebody who is a conduit for information and fuel means that you increase significantly the risk of a Hoover being deployed against you. We are encouraged instinctively and bring our seductive powers to bear on you with a benign follow-up Hoover and, affected by your emotional thinking and therefore of fragility, there is an increased risk that the Hoover will get through and when it does, that you are more likely to respond to it in a positive way provide us with yet more fuel and be drawn back into our grasp. In the way that we delete you effectively when we have a new intimate partner primary source, you must apply the same principle when you effect no contact. It must be total. With regard to the risk of talking about us with other people, or other people talking about us to you, you must ban the use of our name. You must explain to all of those around you that you do not want to hear about us in any way. You should explain that if we do get in contact with one of your friends, you don't want to hear about it and they should not tell you. You should also explain that whilst you understand that they are concerned about you, you no longer want to talk about the narcissist with them and therefore invite them and expressly state that they should not ask. Although it may be tempting to continue to go back over events with your friends, you must resist it, for this is a breach of your no contact and no good will come of it. If you want answers about what happened, I will give them you. You also need to be careful, because, although you may believe that you can trust those in your circle, one of them may, either specifically corrupted by us or more usually inadvertently, provide information to us about how you're feeling and what you're doing, and this will work against you. If you are saying nothing about us, not only are you reducing your emotional thinking and avoiding it increasing, you are avoiding providing any information which can be conveyed to us, thus starving us of fuel and avoiding the Hoover trigger. Banish us from conversation. Do not talk about us. Do not allow others to mention our names in front of you. All it will do is result in fuel being provided to us, cause you to suffer an adverse consequence and increase your emotional thinking. Furthermore, it runs the risk of causing a hoover trigger and generating further hoovers which may impinge upon your no-contact regime and weaken it further. It is a no-contact mistake to continue to talk about us in any capacity. You must stop doing it.